Good evening and welcome to the 10 o'clock news. I'm Don Herndon. And I'm Karen Bush. At noon today, the first person to row across the Pacific Ocean completed his voyage. As he landed in Owaka, Washington, he was greeted by his family and the international press. We will cover the details later in our newscast. The issue of civil rights has divided America for the past few years, but President Bush says that will happen no more. Today, Bush signed civil rights legislation into law, ending a fight with Congress over racial quotas. As Bush puts it, the law will not encourage quota and it won't overturn the government's affirmative action program. President Bush says he still supports government affirmative action programs, but a senior official says others in the administration have other ideas. Today, Bush publicly endorsed affirmative action as he signed a compromise civil rights bill. His public affirmation followed word the White House and prepared a presidential order that would have directed the government to ignore hiring preferences in favor of minorities and women. White House officials say President Bush never saw the presidential order. A senior official say the president vetoed the proposed order, but it wasn't the right time. The officials say there's strong support among the president's advisor to dismantle affirmative action programs. New Hampshire voters will have the opportunity to see the first TV ads of the 1992 presidential contest. Democratic candidate Paul Songus will start airing a 30-second commercial tomorrow. It will highlight his comeback from cancer and overcome the notion that he can't win the nomination. The ad shows the former Massachusetts senator swimming laps in a pool. A narrator says Songus has never been afraid to swim against the current. The ad also notes that Songus has been the underdog in every race he's ever run. The narrator adds guts and determination help Paul Songus beat the odds and go on to beat cancer. Songus left the Senate in 1984 to battle the disease. He, won, he now says he's cured. And turning to international concerns, President Bush approved an additional $1.4 billion in food aid Wednesday for the Soviet Union. The first time he gave the assistance directly to the Soviets rather than the central government. In another economic boost, the House voted 350 to 78 to normalize trade with the Soviet Union by approving the grant of most favored nation status. This would reduce the tariff to the lowest possible level. The administration package is intended to help the discriminating country cope with the food shortages this winter. This is not a foreign program that we're talking about, says an ag agricultural secretary announcing the aid at the White House. This is a domestic program that intends on moving the U.S. benefits to benefits of American farmers who will make them, excuse me, who will make the sales and spend the money. The American economy plans on buying pickup trucks and other things that are manufactured in urban areas. The United Nations Security Council is choosing the world body's next security general. The post is now held by Javier Perez de Cellular, two Africans, Egypt's deputy prime minister and Zimbabwe's climate finance minister led the field of 13 candidates. The U.S. is using troop withdrawals to press North Korea about its atomic bomb program. Today, Defense Secretary Dick Cheney announced that the U.S. is freezing part of the planned pullout of American troops from South Korea. About 40,000 U.S. troops are in South Korea. Washington still means to withdraw 4,000 of them by the end of next year, but Cheney has frozen plans to make further cuts after that. Cheney says the troop announcement is aimed at North Korea's efforts at building a nuclear weapon. North Korea denies it's trying to make a bomb, but has refused to allow inspec inspections of its nuclear sites. And in science news, it sounds odd, but two California scientists say spraying about 50,000 tons of propane over the South Pole could plug the hole in the ozone. The co-author of published, journal, published in the journal Science says they aren't thinking of hiring a fleet of planes anytime soon. But he says within the next 100 years, it might not be such a bad idea. Donald Trump might be getting some dirty looks next time he's in the country club. His, the former billionaire says the income taxes should, should be raised sharply. Trump told the House panel a higher income tax on the, help, on the wealthy could give the rich more incentive to invest their money. The risky inventors instead of parking their bank, excuse me, parking their money in their bank accounts. In Atlanta today, officials at the Centers for Disease Control say the phones have been ringing off the walls. Americans are confronting this wintertime season with the flu. Dr. Walter Gunn, CDC epidemiologist, says this year's outbreak hit early. The worst bug, bug of the bunch is called Type A, Beijing. It causes headaches, fever, nausea, and in some cases, death. 
The CDC is pushing flu shots for those who are particularly at risk. Gunn, Gunn says the flu vaccine takes about two weeks to work. It will not cure the flu, but will protect against most, most serious cases of the flu. The flu has arrived early in Oregon this year. The state health division says a Medford resident who became ill in October is the first to be diagnosed with type A influenza. Other states also are reporting flu cases or regional outbreaks. Most of the cases involve a subtype of type A influenza that's been associated with a large number of deaths among elderly. The health division is advising people over the age of 65 to get a, shoe, excuse me, a flu shot as soon as possible. Researchers say that the time has come for a pneumonia vaccine that has caused skepticism among some doctors. At Yale University, a study by scientists says the vaccine is about 60% effective in preventing some kinds of pneumonia. Dr. Eugene Shapiro directed the study of patients in 11 Connecticut hospitals and says it is now clear that it gives time, time to give the vaccine a wide distribution to those most at risk. The vaccine has been available for 14 years, but many doctors question how well it worked. Pneumonia is the country's most common lethal infection. About 2 million people catch it every year and at least 40,000 die. And coming up next, a French man crossed the Pacific today. We'll be back after this. After four months and 6,300 miles of water, a French man has become the second person to cross the Pacific Ocean by himself in a rowboat. Holding up the oars to his 26-foot boat, he greeted a cheering crowd as he rowed into the fishing village of Ilwaco, Washington. His boat flipped over at least 34 times, including twice this week when he was hit by 80-mile-an-hour winds and a 20-foot seas off the Washington coast. In Ilwaco, Washington, after completing a 6,300-mile voyage, the 42-year-old Debovel docked his high-tech rowboat at noon. He started four months ago in Japan. Dabbleville had, was greeted and kissed by his mother, father, wife, and brother. He shouted to his wife, I'm all right now. I couldn't feel better. His brother says he, looked he looks tired. Dabbleville had to sign papers and pay a $9 fee to the U.S. Customs Service to dock at Iwako. Raymond Nyber, a retired plumber from Cannon Beach, gladly paid the fee for the Frenchman. Dabbleville told French journalists in his native language, I'm pretty good, no good now, okay now. The Frenchman had been due to arrive earlier today, but his progress was slowed by a few hours because of a dangerous current and tricky winds. His personal physician says he is in good shape, but he'll need some muscle therapy after sitting in the same spot for so long. Peter Bird of Britain was the first to row across the Pacific in the early 1980s, but this is the first time the trip has been done from east to west, a journey that's considered more difficult because of ocean currents. A congressional investigation testified on Wednesday that she has found poor health care through the medical facilities of Department of Veterans Affairs, including several causes of sheer neglect that lead to death. In 1987, 1988, and 1989, Portland, Oregon was among several that was listed. From the Umatilla Reservation near Pendleton, the Confederated Tribes are set to begin a study of the potential for casino gambling. Under federal law, games of chance on the reservation would have to be limited to bingo, video poker, blackjack, and others allowed by state law. Roulette and other Las Vegas styles would be banned. The tribes would have to negotiate a compact with the state before gambling could actually begin. The casino site will most likely be along Interstate 84 of Pendleton. The all-male order of the antelope must clean up its act if it wants to continue holding its annual party near Lakeview. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service investigated the activities after an embarrassing article in the Sunday Oregonian. The Oregonian article described the irresponsible actions, rude behavior, and excessive consumption of the alcohol at the annual party. The agency says the order of the antelope must also stop their discriminatory membership practices if they want to continue meeting at the Wildloaf Refuge near Lakeview. Cartoonist Gary Trudeau says a comic strip is not one of those things to be too concerned about. His strip has been the center of controversy lately for a series running through this week discussing allegations that Vice President Quayle used drugs. The allegation was investigated and dismissed as untrue. Trudeau says politicians are taking him too seriously and readers have an uncanny ability to sort them things out themselves. 
So Brandon, it's a bit chilly out there. What's going on? Yeah, well, if you've been out in the last two hours, you're going to realize that it's very, very cold out here in Corvallis, Oregon. Currently 40 degrees and getting a lot colder. I'll be back with more information on that after, day, after today's statistics and commercial break. Going to the stats today, today's high is 54 degrees and the average is 51 degrees. Record was set back in 1961 and that was, no, I'm sorry, the record is 61 degrees, set back in 1933. Today's low was 39 degrees and the average is 36 and the record was 20 degrees set back in 1900. Going to the current conditions right now here in Oregon, 40 degrees, 30.26 barometer, south winds at 6 miles an hour and 74% humidity and it's partly cloudy. We'll be back with more KBVR weather right after this. All right, let's take a look at the high temperatures around the state of Oregon today. We had 51 degrees up in Astoria, 57 degrees down in Coos Bay. All along the Willamette Valley, we had mid-50s, 55 degrees in Eugene. 57 was the high in the state of Oregon today. Going to the east of the Cascades, it was not that much cooler, anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees anywhere, with Klamath Falls being the cool, coolest spot around the state at 45 degrees. Moving on to the 10 o'clock temperatures right now, we had 37 degrees in Astoria, which is very, very cold, 41 down there in Coos Bay, 38 degrees in Medford, 40 degrees in Portland, and 39 degrees in Eugene, 40 degrees in Salem. Very cold all around the state, but the coldest spot right now is Burns at 22 degrees, and that's very cold, and it's actually going to get colder maybe down into the teens there tonight. Very, very chilly. Moving on to the Western satellite map. We have, this is the system that we just had come through and that was where, that caused all the rain and all the, the dysfunction all over the state. But now that's clearing up and there's no clouds anymore. And um, because it's clearing up, that's what's calling, causing it to be a lot cooler. And um, as you see, there's like another system forming right over here, but that's not going to cause that much more rain or anything like that. So this weekend should be pretty much sunny and a lot cooler than normal. Going to the national weather map, Right now, we had 48 degrees in Seattle, 54 degrees in Portland, 81 degrees down in Los Angeles, the high around the state today, 52 degrees in Maine, 70 degrees there in Pennsylvania, 74 degrees in New York, and again, Florida didn't have a temperature because we don't care about Florida when you live in Oregon. Going to the extended forecast right now, we have the coast forecast tonight, partial clearing with fog forming, lows in the upper 20s to the mid 30s, northwest winds are going to be around 15 miles per hour. Tomorrow, mostly sunny, highs near 50. Cascade tonight. There'll be snow flurries and the snow level will be at 4,500 feet. Past temperatures are going to be near 20. That is snow flurries, so it's nothing really to worry about. Tomorrow it's going to be sunny. High is going to be around 30s and the snow level will be at 6,000 feet, though there won't be any snow. But if there was snow, it would be at 6,000 feet. Tonight clearing, late with fog forming, lows near 30. Southwest winds are going to vary and they're going to be light. Tomorrow it'll be clear and sunny. Highs near 15. There might be a chance of rain tomorrow night, but I wouldn't count on going to the quack extended forecast the ducks shall wallow back into their primordial quagmire. They shall bask in their water graves, gasping and gasping and gasping for some relief from their pain that will be inflicted by our most loved killer beavers. And I'm Brandon Evil, and that is weather. So, Corey, it's Civil War time, huh? That's right. It is indeed. Time to press a little duck. We'll be having a little talk with Jerry Pettibone, and we will have a little gymnastics preview when we come back. See you in a couple. It has been two weeks since Magic Johnson of the Los Angeles Lakers tested positive with the HIV virus, thus announcing his retirement from professional basketball. And for Magic Johnson, that's two weeks too long. Johnson is taking steps toward realizing his dream of owning his very own NBA franchise, even though that franchise will most not likely be the Los Angeles Lakers. Johnson recently talked to NBA Commissioner David Stern about buying a team, and without disclosing team names, said that there would be five possibilities. Johnson said that he will meet with Stern in about three weeks for further discussions. There was a jam-packed slate of 10 games in NBA action last night, and here are the results. First of all, we have Boston defeating Indiana 116-101, and Philadelphia takes down the Miami Heat 114-107. Philadelphia and Miami are number one and two in the Atlantic Division. Seattle squeaks by Detroit 96-91, that OSU grad Gary Payton picking up 14 points, and Charlotte just squeaks by Cleveland 109-108. Uh, Utah takes down Orlando 107-102, and Atlanta beats Sacramento 116 to 104. Dominique Wilkins picking up 32 points. New York over Dallas 92 to 89. And San Antonio defeating Minnesota 113 
to 106. San Antonio now has the best record in the NBA with only one loss. Phoenix defeated Denver 113 to 97, and Chicago squeaks by one squeaks by Golden State 112 to 108. And what can I say, Michael Jordan with 35 points. Well, it's here again. The Civil War football game between the Beavs and that team from Eugene. Both teams have had plenty of injuries, resulting in subpar seasons. However, a win Saturday can more than make up for the rest of the year. KPVR's very own Melinda Woodman chatted with Jerry Pettibone about Saturday's game. Tremendous amount of, of respect for the University of Oregon, and I, I really feel like in analyzing their team at the beginning of the season that they had all the ingredients to be a, a, a top 25 team and a, a bowl team this year. But they, uh, they've had a lot of injuries, a lot like we have uh, with a lot of their key players on defense, with uh, several of their uh, top players at quarterback and at running back, and that's hurt them a great deal. And I know there's a lot of excitement, a lot of rivalry, a lot of uh, tradition around uh, this game for, for both schools and that you can virtually throw out the records and whoever shows up down there and, and plays the, the best on, uh, on Saturday with a lot of uh, excitement and emotion will have the best chance to win. Heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield will defend his title this coming Saturday against challenger Burt Cooper. The two are slated for weigh-in tonight and a day of rest tomorrow. Cooper is Holyfield's third opponent in the title fight after challengers Mike Tyson and Francesco Damiani both back down due to injuries. Holyfield right now is a 22 to 1 favorite to win the fight. <clears throat> Once again, it's gymnastics season on the OSU campus. For tonight's edition of the Winter Sports Preview, we take a look at the gymnastics team who returned eight members, four of whom were also all Pac-10 performers. We also take a look at some of the newcomers who will try to fill the void left by incomparable student-athlete Joy Selig. Set back with both Shari Knight and Amy Durham. Uh, both the young ladies suffered stress fractures at the end of last year and right before the World University Games, but they did compete. I was really glad I got to go. Um, I wasn't sure after trials because I messed up, but um, it was a lot of fun and it was fun to be with the team and we did really well and we were just we were really excited about it. It was great. Okay. What I try and concentrate is just improvements in the gym in specific areas, you know, in ways that I could help bring my own all-around score up and help the team score. Very, very good additions. Marilyn Anderson from Washington and Nicole Jensen from Clovis, California. Both will be pretty strong athletes. Uh, they'll walk in and be in the lineup immediately. Uh, we're expecting good things from both of them. The first year is just to work on um, being consistent and my form and stuff and just getting through the first year. And then, like, I'm watering down a little bit, but um, I'll be able to do better tricks next year after I get used to the college life. But we're stronger at the lower end this year than we have been in the past. So uh, if we stay healthy, we, we should be a top contender again. Be the same three teams in front of us, Utah, Alabama, and Georgia. Um, but uh, we, we should be right up in there. Uh, the, the level just keeps getting tougher and tougher every year. Uh, the, the, the teams, the second seed teams, 6 through 12, all picked up this year, so uh, it'll be interesting. You really can't tell until you get out on the uh, competition arena. We also talked to the team's two seniors, Donna Linder and Jennifer McMullen, for their views on their final year. You know, mostly I just really like to end this my strongest year, you know, ever, you know, as well as in college and my previous club gymnastics experience, you know, and, I, and so far it's starting out really good. I'm feeling much stronger than I ever have, and so looks like I could come up with that goal. Here, I've been doing gymnastics since I was four years old, so it's been a while, and I think basically I just want to end on a positive note. I want to make sure that every day in the gym is 100% and it's positive. And the gymnastics team begins their quest for a national championship on January 17th at home against UCLA. Although there are no games, matches, or meets in town this weekend, Eugene is only a short drive away. Once again, our weekend calendar begins with the volleyball team taking on the UCLA Bruins down in Los Angeles tomorrow night. Saturday, the swim, is, swim team is up at Simon Fraser. Women's basketball takes on the University of San Francisco. And the football team is down in Quackland for the big Civil War matchup. On Sunday, the ladies basketball team finishes up their road swing in California by taking on Sacramento State. 
It's the perfect weekend for a road trip, so find someone with a car and get a, rid of a little pre-final stress. And that's sports. Well, it looks like the gymnastics team's, team's going to do really well again this year. They're looking sweet. They're looking sweet, and hopefully this year they'll win it all. Good. Today in world, today is World Hello Day, something that was started by two brothers who believe peace begins with a pleasant greeting. For the last 19 years, Michael and Brian McCormick have been urging world leaders, celebrities, and ordinary people to say hello to 10 people, and it doesn't matter if they're friends or strangers. They say World Hello Day just gives people a chance to do something about the world. And that's it. Uh, that's our last Thursday thanks Thursday newscast for the term. Thanks for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year and all of that. Thanks, thanks for again. joining us. Thank you. <laughs>